This is the story of the community of St. George. I am David Oliver Kling, and I will be your host. So, what is the community of St. George? In order to fully answer that question, let me share our spiritual genealogy so you get the full picture of who we are by understanding where we came from and how we developed. For that reason, our story starts with the Old Catholic Church of the Netherlands, centered in the Dutch city of Utrecht. The First Vatican Council ended on October 20th, 1870, and during the council, several innovations in Catholic theology were established, such as papal infallibility. Some German, Dutch, and Swiss bishops refused to accept the decrees of the Vatican Council. So they contacted the Archbishop of Utrecht. The See of Utrecht had been in schism with Rome since 1724 for similar reasons, issues concerning papal interference in the administration of their diocese. The Union of Utrecht of the Old Catholic Churches was established on September 24, 1889 as a confederation of Catholics who rejected papal infallibility, and they included the Old Catholic Church of the Netherlands. These Old Catholic Churches chose not to align with Protestantism directly because they wanted to remain Catholic, while simultaneously rejecting Roman and Vatican-inspired innovations to the faith. Our story moves from the Netherlands to England and Arnold Harris Matthew. Matthew was born August 7, 1852, to a Roman Catholic father and an Anglican mother. Originally baptized Roman Catholic, he switched to the Church of England, only to switch back to Roman Catholicism. On June 24, 1877, he was ordained a priest in the Roman Church. However, by 1889, he had resigned from all his duties in the Roman Catholic Church because of his struggles with the doctrine of papal infallibility. Eventually, Matthew would be consecrated a bishop by Gerardus Gull, the Archbishop of Utrecht. The consecration took place on April 28, 1908, at the Church of St. Gertrude in Utrecht. Bishop Matthew then returned to England as the Regionary Bishop of the Old Catholic Church in the British Isles. By December 1910, Bishop Matthew went rogue, and he severed official ties with Utrecht. However, he continued to try to establish Old Catholicism in England, now under the name Old Roman Catholic Church of Great Britain, with himself installed as the Metropolitan and Old Catholic Archbishop of London. The year 1913 saw a steady stream of people into Archbishop Matthew's local congregation, and on July 22, 1913, James Ingall Wedgwood was ordained to the priesthood. Wedgwood and the people he brought into the old Roman Catholic Church of Great Britain were fervent theosophists. The Theosophical Society was founded in 1875 by Helena Petrovna Blavatsky. And Julian Rees describes the theosophical phenomenon as, quote, Theosophy, broadly speaking, advances the view that there is a deeper spiritual reality which can be accessed through intuition, meditation, or some other state transcending human consciousness, and that human beings are sparks of the divine trapped in the material world who desire to return to their spiritual home, end quote. By 1896, a sort of mission statement of the society was formulated known as the Three Objects. And these three objects are still being used today. The first object, to form a nucleus of the universal brotherhood of humanity without distinction of race, creed, sex, caste, or color. The second object, to encourage the study of comparative religion, philosophy, and science. And finally, the third object, to investigate unexplained laws of nature and the powers latent in man. The Theosophical Society connection is important to our story. And remember, Father James Ingall Wedgwood and several members of Archbishop Matthew's local congregation were avid theosophists. On October 28, 1914, Archbishop Matthew consecrated a former Anglican priest, Frederick Samuel Willoughby, to the episcopacy. Willoughby's consecration was to ensure the continuation of apostolic succession within the old Roman Catholic Church of Great Britain, because by this time, Matthew was starting to get old. On August 6, 1915, Archbishop Matthew wrote a pastoral letter to all the members of the church condemning the Theosophical Society and prohibiting anyone in the church from being a member of the society. This action would be devastating to the old Roman Catholic Church of Great Britain. Father Wedgwood, in a letter to Matthew, dated November 12, 1915, declared himself independent of Matthew, but not of Old Catholicism. Subsequently, all the theosophically-minded clergy also resigned, and Wedgwood was elected to the episcopacy by his fellow priests, who turned to Bishop Willoughby for help. On February 13, 1916, 
James Ingall Wedgwood was consecrated a bishop by Bishop Willoughby and two other bishops, also theosophists, Bernard Gauntlet and Robert King. This date is considered as the date of the founding of the liberal Catholic Church, with James Wedgwood as its first presiding bishop. The Theosophical connection to the early development of the liberal Catholic Church was important, and Julie Byrne writes about this connection with the following, quote, The liberal Catholic Church made full use of theosophy to fulfill, as the founders saw it, the promise of Catholicism. Like the esoteric revival in France, the hugely influential Theosophical Society offered rational but re-enchanted pathways through modernity and general optimism about human spiritual evolution, end quote. While theosophy was important to Wedgwood, Bishop Ian Hooker, the ninth presiding bishop of the liberal Catholic Church, writes of Wedgwood with the following, quote, Notwithstanding his heavy reliance on the members and resources of the Theosophical Society, Wedgwood was not building a church just for theosophists. From the beginning, he saw the LCC as a haven for open-minded, liberally inclined Christians no longer comfortable in mainstream churches. In time, he believed these people would form the majority of liberal Catholics, end quote. Still, Wedgwood needed to build a community, which brings us to another very important figure to our story, Charles Webster Leadbeater. Charles Leadbeater had been a priest in the Anglican Communion, but left the Church of England in favor of retaining his membership in the Theosophical Society. On July 22, 1916, Father Charles Webster Leadbeater was consecrated a bishop by Wedgwood, and eventually, Leadbeater would become the second presiding bishop of the liberal Catholic Church. I would argue that Bishop Wedgwood was the foundational cornerstone of the liberal Catholic Church, but that Bishop Leadbeater was the chief architect of what would become the liberal Catholic tradition or movement. Which brings us to another often forgotten phenomenon in the development of the liberal Catholic movement, and that is the influence of Freemasonry on the development of the Church. Leadbeater was initiated into Freemasonry by Wedgwood, and together with Annie Besant, a prominent theosophist and co-mason, they created a tripartite alliance involving the Theosophical Society, the Liberal Catholic Church, and Le Droit Humain, an order of Freemasonry that allowed both men and women. Bishop Leadbeater wrote about the Masonic connection with the following, quote, All who have worked in the Liberal Catholic Church or in the earlier degrees of co-masonry know that the chief object of these great organizations is to draw down spiritual influence from on high and to radiate it out upon the surrounding world in a form in which that world can readily assimilate it, end quote. Freemasonry was seen as a sort of applied theosophy. Since the Theosophical Society lacked a ritual or liturgy, but Freemasonry was rich with ceremony. You can see how Besant and Leadbeater influenced one another through a careful reading of Masonic ritual and liberal Catholic liturgy created during their respective tenures within both the church and the lodge. Both Besant and Leadbeater were prolific writers, and Andy Besant's book, Esoteric Christianity, and Bishop Leadbeater's Science of the Sacraments were both essential reading for the esoterically-minded Christian of the early 20th century. The liberal Catholic Church, heavily influenced by theosophy, allowed for such beliefs as reincarnation and karma. Additionally, one of the theological hallmarks of the liberal Catholic Church is universal salvation, as seen in the Credo, said in the liturgy, which states, quote, We believe that God is love and power and truth and light, that perfect justice rules the world, that all his sons shall one day reach his feet, however far they stray. We hold the fatherhood of God, the brotherhood of man. We know that we do serve him best when best we serve our brother man. So shall his blessing rest upon us, peace forevermore. Amen. End quote. Essential to the Catholic identity of the liberal Catholic Church is its adherence to seven sacraments. Over the years, the liberal Catholic Church moved from being just a church to a movement with several schisms over the years, ranging from controversies over the ordination of women to any reference whatsoever to theosophy. However, one constant remained, and that was the insistence on the sacramental nature of the church. It was unequivocally a sacramental movement, a Catholic movement. This brings us to another point in our story, the telling of our spiritual genealogy. 
The liberal Catholic Church movement is not Protestant, but it's not Roman Catholic either. It is not Eastern Orthodox or Oriental Orthodox for that matter. The liberal Catholic movement is squarely placed in what is known as the independent sacramental movement, a phrase that is itself problematic, but the one currently in common usage today. The independent sacramental movement has four important characteristics, independent, sacramental, apostolic, and diverse. A succinct explanation of these characteristics is independent of ecclesiastical oversight by the likes of Rome, Constantinople, or Canterbury. Jurisdictions or micro-denominations are autonomous. Sacramental in that they promote the seven sacraments believed to have been instituted by Jesus Christ. Apostolic in that the belief is that the priesthood can be traced back to Jesus and the belief that by laying on of hands by the bishop, this apostolic succession is continued to be transmitted. The final characteristic is diversity. Today, you can find jurisdictions that are extremely conservative and others that are so liberal they are unrecognizable to most Christians as Christians. Our story now moves back to the Netherlands and the city of Nilversum. It is here on the Feast of Whitsunday, June 4, 2006, that Marcus van Alphen, a priest in the liberal Catholic Church, is consecrated to the episcopacy by Bishop Johannes van Alphen, his father, who had been the eighth presiding bishop of the liberal Catholic Church. It is this date in 2006 that inaugurated the Young Rite, a micro-denomination within the liberal Catholic tradition. Marcus van Alphen was born June 27, 1960, in Pretoria, South Africa, into a theosophical and liberal Catholic family. Raised in the liberal Catholic Church and within theosophy, Marcus wrote about theosophy with, quote, The theosophical tenets were, as they still are, as natural to me as breathing, recognizing the many religions as different ways to the same state of enlightenment. Adding the theosophical teachings to Christianity gave me the key to understanding the power of ritual, end quote. Likewise, in talking about his youth, Marcus wrote, quote, As a young toddler, I would laze around on the floor whilst my father or some visiting priest or bishop celebrated the Eucharist. I can vaguely remember the sunbeams shining through the windows, creating colored shafts of light and the incense still hanging in the air. The zing of a well-celebrated Eucharist, that very particular atmosphere that was built up, was quite normal for me. End quote. Marcus, while the priest in the liberal Catholic Church, grew weary of the stagnation he saw within the church, he decided it was time to put new wine into new wineskins and stop trying to change the system that was the liberal Catholic Church of the 21st century. The young right was named as such to promote a youthful spirit that always looks to keep the liberal Catholic tradition fresh and vibrant, and the use of right to stress our emphasis on the efficacy of sacramental ritual, especially the Eucharist. Another characteristic of the young right is an esoteric understanding of Christianity, which Bishop Marcus writes with, quote, As to the esoteric orientation of the young right, this is a natural consequence of the philosophical tenets regarding relevancy, authority, responsibility, and unity. A literal interpretation of scriptures or the Catholic tradition would make this manner of working untenable. Not the letter, but the spirit of the word is my guideline. Without wishing to devalue the entirety of the scriptures by one single iota, the radical message of Christianity to me can surely be summarized in, love thy neighbor as thyself. This is a command in a positive sense. In like spirit, the young right attempts to offer possibilities, not organizational rules and regulations, end quote. Bishop Marcus also updated the liberal Catholic credo said during the Young Right Liturgy, which reads, We believe that God is love and power and truth and light, that perfect justice rules the world, that all shall one day reach perfection, however far they stray. We hold the parenthood of God, the brotherhood of humanity. We know that we do serve God best when best we serve our neighbor. So shall God's blessing rest on us in peace forevermore. Amen. On March 2nd, 2008, Father Aristide Pavlisic, also a theosophist, was consecrated to the episcopacy by bishops Marcus van Alphen, Johannes van Alphen, and Bishop Alistair Bate. Bishop Aristide had been a priest in the liberal Catholic Church in Slovenia and started his ministry when Slovenia was a part of communist Yugoslavia. Bishop Aristide is a wise, fatherly figure who once wrote, quote, Above all, I want to remind people about the importance of the female aspect. 
the importance of goddess, great mother of our world, the one who is omnipresent, and to offer the significant teaching of a proper attitude towards the goddess, how utterly important it is to be aware and to see the sacredness in everything and every being, especially in every female being, end quote. As the young rite developed, it would eventually be governed through a presbyterial style of leadership, through a council of three that consisted of bishops Marcus van Alphen, Aristide Havlicek, and Domen Kosovar, who was consecrated in 2012. The young rite developed into an umbrella organization that would come to include affiliated jurisdictions as part of the greater young rite community, similar to, but on a much smaller scale, and how the Roman Catholic Church has other rites within its own umbrella, such as the Roman Rite, the Byzantine Rite, and several others. Transplanting the Young Rite to the United States was challenging for the Young Rite's Council of Three. Due to a lack of stability and clearly defined leadership, the Young Rite in the United States experienced several growing pains. On October of 2014, I, David Oliver Kling, petitioned the Young Rite for incarnation, which is another way of saying formal acceptance and membership of a cleric into a jurisdiction or microdenomination within the independent sacramental movement. I had been a bishop in the movement since September of 2004, originally affiliated with the now defunct House of Bishops within the Universal Gnostic Church. Bishop Aristide, in a message to the Young Rite clergy in the United States, wrote about my request for incarnation. Since the clergy were given a vote to approve my incarnation request, Bishop Aristide wrote, quote, Dear friend, Bishop Marcus has asked you to a decision on Bishop David. I don't want to influence your decision, but nevertheless would like to share my thoughts with you. The herd needs a shepherd. Without a shepherd, the flock is in danger. The larger the herd, several shepherds are needed, but it all starts with the first shepherd so the herd can grow. The young right needs a shepherd who is at your disposal. We, Bishops Marcus, Doman, and Aristide, are also shepherds, but are unfortunately too far to be at your disposal in moments of urgency. Signed, Bishop Aristide, end quote. On November 23, 2014, I was incarnated. I sought out affiliation with the young right because I longed for acceptance, authenticity, and community. I found it. However, the young right in the United States suffered from an identity crisis. We were the place someone would go to to be ordained to the priesthood and then filter off somewhere else. It was as if the young right's lawn wasn't green enough, and therefore the grass was always greener somewhere else. Something needed to be done to give the young right in the United States a better sense of identity and the stability that we needed. On September 29, 2015, Bishop Marcus Van Alphen retired from active leadership of the Young Right to focus on his career as an educator and psychologist. On May 5th, the Feast of the Ascension, 2016, I was chosen by Bishops Aristide and Doman to replace Bishop Marcus on the Council of Three. This certainly helped the Young Right in the United States have a greater voice within the Young Right International, but the struggle with identity still remained. Four years after my incarnation, on All Saints Day 2018, the community of St. George was founded as part jurisdiction and part religious order within the Young Rite. The purpose of the community of St. George is to build up a community of priests and would-be priests through support, education, and mentoring under the spiritual auspices of St. George. The community was founded to build a Young Right community in the United States composed of people who are committed to working together to build community and keep alive the vision of the Young Right while also manifesting something new. The community of St. George is a fellowship of clerics ranging from the minor orders to bishops. The Young Right in the United States needed a solid foundation and within our sacramentally rich tradition, we need a strong priesthood as our foundation. So why St. George? Why not some other saint? The answer to that question is twofold. First, St. George is a saint that is revered in both Occidental and Oriental churches. You can find parish churches dedicated to St. George from Roman Catholicism to the Church of England, from Greek Orthodoxy to Ethiopian Orthodoxy. St. George represents Christian unity, which is something both the young rite and the community of St. George strive to foster. Secondly, the story of St. George is both inspiring and mythical, as told through the story of his martyrdom on one hand and his slaying of the dragon on the other. St. George is the perfect balance between esoteric and exoteric, a balanced spirituality, a 
that the community of St. George wishes to maintain. On November 8, 2019, at the convocation of the community of St. George in Marysville, Ohio, the holy rule of the community was released, not to create an emphasis on organizational rules and regulations as Bishop Marcus Van Alphen opposed, but to create a sense of identity and foundation for our purpose as a priestly society, a glue to hold us together. The background of the rule of St. George starts back in the early 1990s when I was a Benedictine monk at Christ the King Monastery in Coleman, Alabama. Upon leaving the monastery, I lived with the priest within the Romanian Byzantine Rite within the Roman Catholic Church. It was while living at St. George Romanian Greek Catholic Cathedral that I was exposed daily to a short prayer known as a troparion to St. George, who was the patron of the cathedral, and the troparion was sung during the divine liturgy each day. Years later, this prayer would be the inspiration for both the community of St. George and its holy rule. I drew upon my background in Benedictine monasticism, Byzantine spirituality, along with my own experiences within theosophy and the Freemasonry of Ladois Humane. The troparion of St. George is, as a savior of the enslaved, benefactor of the poor, doctor of the sick, guardian of kings, and bearer of victory. O great martyr George, pray to Christ our God to save our souls, now and always, and forever and ever. Amen. It is through this prayer that the characteristics of the community of St. George are manifested. These characteristics being a commitment to justice and those who are marginalized, a commitment to service towards the poor and those who are suffering, a commitment to healing those who suffer from spiritual pain, a commitment to Christian unity, specifically within sacramental Christianity, but also embracing an ecumenical spirit with non-sacramental Christian communities. This commitment is best manifested in a striving towards knowledge and formation and helping other Christians through education and the sharing of spiritual gifts. A commitment that as celebrants, we, the clergy within the community of St. George, bear witness to Jesus Christ as victor over death. A commitment to humility. An understanding that our intentions are important and to strive to live by the ideal of, in all things may God be glorified. To these commitments, our foundational cornerstone is laid while we live out our commitment and understanding the liberal Catholic Church tradition that embraces a non-literal esoteric approach to sacramental Christianity as exemplified by the Young Right. Like the Council of Three that governs the Young Right, the community of St. George also has a presbyterial style of leadership composed of three presiding bishops, the Master of Studies who chairs the governing bishops and maintains the course of study. I serve the community in this capacity. The Master of Patronage is our ecclesiastical endorser, and Bishop Kirk Jeffrey serves as Master of Patronage. And the Master of Formation, held by Bishop Robert Lamoureux, who serves as Vocation and Formation Director. As a manifestation of our work, there are three things we hope to strive to be. Stewards of tradition, keeping alive the rich liturgy of the liberal Catholic Church, along with patristic studies linking us to the early church and the history of of old Catholicism from which we sprang, to be architects of innovation. Once rooted in tradition, we wish to experiment and guard against stagnation, always keeping our eyes open to innovation and spiritual progress. And finally, to be artificers of culture, to work to change the often dysfunctional culture of the independent sacramental movement by moving away from this idea of independent and towards fostering a new idea of a united sacramental movement and work towards unity and cooperation. So this is our story, the short version that is. Oh wait, there was one more thing. I asked several folks within the community of St. George to share with me why they are here in the community and here are their responses. The Right Reverend Bishop Kirk Jeffrey. I am part of the community of St. George because I have been a called as a pastor for almost the entirety of my life. Since I was a young teenager, I felt that call. And I grew up in the United Methodist tradition and naturally followed that path and became ordained clergy in the United Methodist tradition and then served there in uh, you know, many capacities as pastor over the, over the couple of decades that I was was uh, actually a pastor there and then just got so frustrated with the whole thing about United Methodism and how money was being spent and how much it actually cost to 
keep me around in local parishes and you know all of that stuff and then then we come down to other things like who is included and who is not included within the realm of the church uh, who gets to be ordained who doesn't and then and so i ended up turning in my credentials but god was not done with me yet and uh, then Oliver actually and I started having conversations and then he invited me to join in with the uh, Young Right and that's where I found myself and it is a great place to be. We're opening, we're, we're open, we're affirming, we go out of our way to try to help others and do things and trying to do the work of God in the space that we, we find ourselves. The Right Reverend Bishop Robert Lamoureux. I joined the community of St. George based on my history with looking up Marcus Van Alphen, who was the founder, and uh, read a lot of his work, met him in person, and was inspired by his ideas and where he was heading with the Young Right. Works very well within my reference of what and who I am as a person and who I am as a cleric. That history works very well into what the community of St. George has become, and I've been very inspired by the vision and where we're heading. The Reverend Mother Heidi Salmonson. This is Heidi Salmonson in Fairfield, Iowa, and I am a, a part of community of St. George and Young Right because it represents my highest first. And by that I mean, at my age, 71 years old, I don't want to waste my time with anything less than a very high moral compass and integrity. And I love the community of St. George that it is committed to everything I'm committed to, justice, service, healing, other Christian unity. These are all things that are really important to me in an abstract way, but also a really personal way. For years, I've been on the path of becoming a priest, and I went to seminary. And finally, finally, I was able to fulfill my dream of being ordained as a woman priest in the independent sacramental movement by Bishop Oliver Kling. And that was just one of the best things that ever happened in my life. So I appreciate this group. I feel like they are very impeccable in terms of the way they do things. They're not flaky. They follow through. And I feel very accepted and appreciated for who I am as a woman, a grandma, an older person. <laughs> I feel like my gifts are very, very much appreciated and welcome. So it's a good fit for me at this time in my life. The Reverend Subdeacon Tim Oliveri. I am in the community of St. George because I receive the support I feel I need as a member of clergy, while also having the freedom to engage with members of the community as I see fit. When I was a religious brother and a seminarian in a Roman Catholic religious order, there was a time when I attended an interfaith service at an Episcopal church, and I was so caught up in the moment that I received communion as part of this service and I got in trouble with my community. And I felt at that time that while I had plenty of community support, that this was a limitation on how I would engage with the interfaith community, how I would connect with other people. Beyond the sacramental aspect of the Eucharist, this was a time when I was breaking bread with people of different faiths. And so I find that in the community of St. George, I am able to connect, I am able to meet with, I am able to explore with other people and meet them where they are, without fear that I am I'm going to cross one of those lines that were very rigid when I was with the Roman Catholic Church. And Mr. Richard Lindsay. I'm here because I wanted connection, connection with community, connection with, with friends, and finding a way to look deeper within myself and discover uh, what, I, what I truly wanted as far as becoming a priest, what I was capable of, of doing for my community and for myself. So that's why I chose the community of St. George.